بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه الأنصار إن شاء الله We've been studying the verses 45 to 48 of chapter 33 سورة الأحزاب about the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم we already mentioned some of the points as a reminder I start with reading the verses from the beginning أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها النبي إنا أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا وبشر المؤمنين بأن لهم من الله فضلا كبيرا ولا تتع الكافرين والمنافقين ودع أضاهم وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا O the Prophet truly we have sent you as a witness as a giver of the good news and as a warner and as a one who calls towards God with his leave and as an illuminating light we talked about these verses and last week in particular we talked about the concept of calling people, inviting people towards God bi'ithnillah and we said this has very a special meaning in the Quran wasirajan munira the Prophet has not only brought the light in the form of a book which is the Quran but he himself is also light he himself is a source of light it's not that someone who was in darkness was given light someone who is blind carrying light he himself is light and he has been given light so Allah says he is Siraj and this Siraj is Munir it's continuously giving light and we explained why we said that this is because of the salutations that the Prophet received from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which in turn is based on his continuous remembrance of Allah then Allah says وَبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ although we have said مُبَشِّرًا in the beginning وَالنَّذِيرًا then Allah again says وَبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ this is a second time for giving بشارة and there is a difference between the, these two the first refers to the general Bishara, good news, glad tidings that the Prophet gives to people provided that they accept, they follow him. It's a still the beginning, for example, of Rasala, or a still someone has not decided. So the Prophet says, if you follow this message, you are going to benefit if you disregard and ignore or reject you are going to lose so this tapshir at the beginning is for the people who have not yet decided but then those who decide to follow there is a second Bashara for them وَبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ those who have followed those who have showed their submission and commitment to this message Allah says again give them the good news what is the good news there is something very important for them and that is Fadlan Kabira 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a great favor for them. When Allah says something is great, it's really great. If me and you say something is great, it depends on our understanding of greatness. So, if I see something, for example, which is bigger than me, I say this is great. For example, you know, if I see a big house in which thousands of people like me can live together peacefully without you know, conflict, I say it's a big house, it's a palace. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the whole dunya is little. Why? Because everyone measures things according to his own standards. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the entire world, material world, is too little. So he says that for the people who are believers, there is a great favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala awaiting, prepared for them. What is this Fadl al Kabira? For sure, it cannot be something from this dunya. How much you can give someone in this dunya? Even if you give him the whole dunya, you can see, say for example, whatever money you want, any land you want to choose, any car, any dress, any food, we will give you. It's nothing. Because the whole dunya is ghalil. This must be something greater than, than worldly pleasure, worldly blessings. وَبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بِأَنَّ لَهُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ فَضْلًا كَبِيرًا In my understanding, this must refer to something which happens in the hereafter. This is something that can only heaven accommodate. This world cannot accommodate this. There is a great rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala waiting for the mu'mineen, which you cannot bring even half of it or quarter of it to this dunya. What Allah gives to mu'mineen in heaven cannot be even divided to ten parts and you say we bring one of it to this dunya. This is very special according to Allah's measure, according to Allah's standards. And this is Fadl. What is Fadl? For sure there is a connection between Fadl and Rahmah. But they are not the same. There must be a difference. In some verses of the Quran, Fadl and Rahmah are mentioned together. For example, Lawla Fadlullah alaykum wa rahmatuhu. Had it not been for Allah's favor and mercy, you were losers. Had it not been for Allah's favor and mercy, you would have followed shaitan except few. Had it not been for Allah's favor and mercy, you were not able to achieve piety. So this Allah's fadl and rahmah must be at least conceptually different. It cannot be just a repetition. What is the difference between fadl and Rahman. If we look at the meaning, a literal meaning of Fadl, we realize that in Arabic, normally when something is more than what you expect or what you have been waiting for, this is called Fadl. For example, if we prepare some food and then something from food remains. This is Fadl. Or for example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam, there was a clay. If there is a remaining of that clay, that is called Fadl. Like what we have in Hadith, Shi'atuna khulqu min fadlati natana. 
or she are created from the remaining clay from which we are created. This is fabulous. So anything which is in abundance, which is in coming in large quantity, it fulfills all your needs and requirements that it still has something extra. This is fabulous. So my understanding is this, that fadl is a type of rahmah. But fadl is that type of rahmah that goes beyond your expectation. And by being more than your expectation, I mean something which is more than what you deserve. Because sometimes someone gives you something that you don't deserve. But still, it's understandable. It still can be expected. For example, if I work for someone who is generous, very kind, very generous, and I know that what he has to pay me is, say, for example, $100. I have done something for him and the normal payment for such a work is hundred dollars. If he gives me hundred fifty dollars, this is what I don't deserve. But still, it's something that I could expect because I know he's generous and he's always giving, you know, more than what is paid in average. But if someone instead of giving me hundred dollars gives me one thousand dollars hundred thousand dollars one million dollar not only this is not what i don't deserve but it's something that even i didn't expect because there are things that you don't deserve but you can still expect you would not be shocked but sometimes you don't deserve and you are shocked you cannot believe it takes you time to realize what has happened you know, you become really shocked. I didn't deserve this and I didn't think even that one day I'm going to be given this. This is in my understanding the meaning of fadl. So Allah gives so much that you could not imagine, you could not expect. So it's a special type of rahmah when it goes beyond your expectation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that give this news to the believers that Allah would have such a, a special favor. It's not just going to heaven. It's not just being forgiven. Something very special. Something that only Allah can think of giving it and actually giving it. There are two things. Think of giving it and actually giving it sometimes you cannot even think of someone giving this because we are very limited and our expectations are also limited then Allah says Wala wal you have been sent as a messenger your mission is clear you are a witness you are a giver of good news you are a warner you are a light which is illuminating for sure, there are people who love darkness. Not by their nature. No human beings by his nature loves darkness. But there are people who have so much lived in darkness that now they are used to it. You know, we all love light. But if for some time you remain in a dark room, then if someone, you know, all of a sudden switches off the light, you say, please switch it off. I have problem with my vision. It's difficult for me because I have been used to darkness. So there are people who enjoy being in darkness. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kaman mathaluhu fi dhulumat. Is he the one who has been given light, like the one who is darkness and la yakhruju? He doesn't want to go out. He's enjoying himself there. So these people for sure would not love your mission. They want you to stop. Don't listen to them. 
Do your own work. Don't stop because there are people who want you to stop. And for sure, if you don't listen to them, then they are going to annoy you. If you listen to them, there is no problem. In my understanding, this is coming after the previous one. لا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين ودع عذاهم because when you don't listen when you don't obey them they start annoying you then Allah says okay forget what they do don't pay attention to them don't lose your patience and your courage when they annoy you وتوكل على الله your mission comes from Allah and your power also comes from Allah and your support also comes from Allah so only trust him don't worry if there are people who don't like your mission if there are people who try to annoy you when we have problems and we think that we can solve our problems it seems that we are giving a message to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I am fine and you don't need to help me this is very wrong because even for the slightest problem that we may face our power, our understanding is not enough. A mu'min is the one who works everything in the street of tawakkul. And if you trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it's not important how much power you have, how much knowledge you have. Because you are working as an agent for God. Do you understand the difference? Sometimes I think that I am the boss I am in charge and I rely on my own talents and power and energy and helpers and just for example say to God please help me this is not enough sometimes I entrust my affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is the boss I am only his agent I'm only working according to his instructions then the situation is totally different then the power that we have would be unlimited the guidance would be not limited so Allah says for sure when Allah is in charge of your affairs when you entrust your affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he would be sufficient who is going to stop Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is going to defeat na'udhu billah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa tawakkal ala Allah wa kafa billahi vakila how much Allah is going to be in charge how much Allah is going to be involved depends on how much I let him be involved sometimes people think that tawakkul is something that doesn't depend on people there is such a thing as tawakkul that everyone who uses this concept would benefit and would receive the same amount of support this is not the case how much Allah is your vakil depends on how you are in trusting him how you are good in your tawakkul Allah doesn't have the same treatment for everyone if I do proper tawakkul, if I do whatever I can do, but with this understanding that I am acting as an agent of Allah and He's in charge, then this is the true tawakkul. But if I just, you know, want to be lazy in Billah and don't do anything and say, you know, I trust Allah, or if I think that I can do everything and I just want to have Allah as my backup this is not enough so it's very important how much we do tawakkul wa kafa billahi wakila 
something similar about this idea of some people annoying the Prophet is mentioned again in this surah later surah ahzab verses 56 57 in Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallamu taslima Allahumma sallu alayhi wa sallamu Truly Allah and his angels continuously send salutations to the Prophet. So as a result, you, those who believe, should send salutations to him and be submissive to him. Sending salam to the Prophet is a kind of submission to the Prophet. So although in some hadith we have sallamu taslima as saying salam and salawat, and in some it's submission, there is no conflict. Because when you say salam to someone, it means that I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to annoy you. Then, verse 57. Those who annoy Allah and his messenger. Those who, instead of sending salutations, instead of asking rahmah from Allah for the Prophet, they annoy the Prophet They would be cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala They would be kept far from Allah's mercy If you ask Allah to send mercy to the Prophet Then Allah would send mercy to you If you try to keep mercy away from the Prophet You will be kept away from Allah's mercy This is the rule if you love the Prophet, Allah will love you. If you send salawat to him, pray for him, ask rahmah for him, you would be given similar things, according to your capacity, of course. But if you start praying against Rasulullah, troubling Rasulullah, and Allah, then you would be treated the same. So, Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ If you look at this carefully, you find that there is a beautiful point here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes himself involved. I don't think there was anyone who was trying to annoy Allah. Indeed, it's a kind of problematic concept to say to annoy Allah. How can someone annoy Allah? They were annoying Rasul Allah, but Allah is saying, annoying my prophet is annoying me. With extension, with a kind of a stretching, the meaning of annoying. So Allah says, you think you have annoyed my prophet? Indeed, you have been annoying me as well. So Allah is involving himself. Because you cannot have problem with my prophet, with my messenger, unless you have problem with me. So Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَعْنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ In dunya, they will be kept away from his mercy. So they would not be able to achieve what they want. And in the hereafter, they would be far from Allah's mercy. So they will not have happiness. So perhaps in dunya they would not have happiness and success. In the akhirah also they would not have happiness and success because they are far from the mercy of Allah. وَأَعَدَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا muhina, And Allah has prepared for them a humiliating punishment. Something that is not only hurting them but also removing their honor and dignity because they have been fighting and annoying and troubling the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I want to move on to the verse 159 of chapter 3, Ali Imran. These verses are very much related. And when we want to understand the Quranic image of the Prophet, we should bring all these verses together. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim 
فبما رحمة من الله لنت لهم ولو كنت فضا غليظ القلب لنفضوا من حولك فاعف عنهم واستغفر لهم وشاورهم في الأمر فإذا عزمت فتوكل على الله إن الله يحب المتوكلين الله says because of mercy from Allah you have become soft the mercy which comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you soft makes you merciful makes you kind it's impossible to be close to Allah to receive rahmah from Allah and be harsh be angry be arrogant be aggressive it's impossible the more you receive from Allah the closer you are to Allah the more merciful the more lenient the more flexible you are of course you have your principles but you don't need to fight with people over your principles you try to be very soft you try to accommodate people as much as possible because there is no ego there is no selfishness I don't have any problem with anyone I am at service of Allah who is the Lord of everyone yes again there are people who come to annoy you there are people who come to trouble you that's another issue but you don't have any restriction you don't have any limitation for offering your love and your mercy to people so Allah says فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لَنْ تَلَّهُمْ you have become soft you are a real gentleman sometimes I make a comparison here and I love to do it again here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam and his brother Harun he says you should go and speak to Pharaoh don't say we don't speak to Pharaoh but how should they speak to Pharaoh قُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيَّنًا You have to speak with Fir'aun in a soft language. لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ أَوْ يَخْشَى Maybe even Fir'aun remembers. Maybe his heart becomes soft. There are lots of points here I don't want to mention. Just I want to make a comparison. Allah says to Musa and Harun alayhim as-salam Speak to Fir'aun in a soft manner this is a command and it is also about a speech so it's a command it's not a statement it's not that Allah says you spoke in a soft manner it's, it's a command and it's only about a speech قُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيَّنَا But when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it is not a command, it's a statement لِنْتَ لَهُمْ Allah doesn't say كُنْ لَيَّنَا لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It's a statement Allah confirms that this has happened Without Allah telling anywhere in the Quran that you have to be soft. Do you understand the point? It's not that Allah instructed him to be soft. And then we say, okay, the Prophet must have achieved this because he obeys Allah. No, Allah says you are soft. And it is not only with respect to a speech. It doesn't say, لَنْتَ لَهُمْ فِي الْقَوْلِ he doesn't say you spoke in a soft manner. He says you have become a soft person. Your whole personality is soft. You are a soft person in every aspect of your personality. Not only you speak nicely. You treat people nicely in every aspect. You look at them nicely. Sometimes I can speak with you nicely, but I can look at you with anger. Or I may ignore you. But Rasulullah was 
even in looking at people very nice and very kind, he was dividing his vision to people equally, looking at everyone. And everyone, when he was with Rasulullah, he was thinking that he is very special. No one was feeling that he is ignored. He was so much loving people that everyone thought that the Prophet loves him maybe more than others. So, Lintalahum, you have become very soft. Had you been harsh and hard, hard hearted, they would have all rejected you, left you, scattered, and you would have remained alone. Even if you have Quran, but you don't have that akhlaq of the Prophet, you will remain alone. The people who knew you for many decades, the people who learned their religion from you, they owe you their Islam. If they see there is no akhlaq in you, they will leave you. So what about us? People don't know us that much, and people don't, know their, uh, don't owe their Islam to us. How can then they remain with us if we don't have good akhlaq? لو كنت فضا غليظ القلب لن فضوا من حولك. Were these people nice people all the time? Were these people treating Prophet with respect and reverence? <coughs> Not all the time. In many times they used to annoy Prophet. <coughs> we just said وداع ذاهم. We just said, Even believers used to sometimes annoy Prophet. Muslims used to annoy Prophet, as we said in previous sessions. Used to enter the house of the Prophet without permission. Used to call him by his first name from outside his house, asking him to come out. Many ways. But that's not going to change the manner of the Prophet. So Allah says, Fa'fu anhum. Forgive them, pardon them. If they do something wrong, if they annoy you, forgive them. Because if people are nice, then how can you understand I am a soft person or not? A person is recognized as a soft gentleman if he is annoyed and troubled and he still remains the same. When he goes through all the difficulties and he remains the same. The Prophet was wrong, but Allah says, you have been soft with them and forgive them. Because if you don't forgive them, then these people would have problem. They would suffer. Allah says to the Prophet, forgive them so that they would not be questioned and punished by, because of annoying you. When someone annoys the Prophet, there are two sides. One is that he has annoyed the Prophet, so the Prophet has a right over him, and the Prophet can forgive. But Allah also has a right here. If I wrong my brother, my sister, my neighbor. This is right of God and right of people. This is haqullah and haqul nas. He or she should forgive me, but I also should ask Allah to forgive me. Maybe I annoy someone and he forgives me, but has Allah forgiven me? So Allah says, fa'fu anhum, you forgive them, but there is still something that I should forgive because they have annoyed you. Ask me also to forgive them. Look at the mercy of Allah. Allah says, forgive them and 
ask forgiveness for them, which means ask me to forgive them. So he wants to forgive them, but he wants Rasulullah to intercede for them so that they better appreciate the role of Rasulullah and also because of Rasulullah, then Allah forgives them. So Allah is looking for some excuse to forgive them. فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ لَهُمْ So it's very interesting. The people who were wronging Rasulullah, not only, not only Rasulullah forgives them, but now he says, okay, let me help you further. I am going to intercede for you and ask Allah also to forgive you. Okay? It's like, for example, you have a neighbor who has created lots of trouble for you. Okay? As a result, now he is taken to the court because of troubling you. He has, for example, you know, broken your door, your windows, everything. Now he's taken to the court. Why he has been taken to the court? For wronging you, hurting you. But in the court, you say, I have forgiven him and please forgive him. For my sake, please forgive him. So now you intercede for him. So Rasulullah not only forgives, but also intercedes. This is the mercy of Rasulullah. وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Listen to these people and consult them. The same people that sometimes have annoyed you. The same people who don't have that much knowledge necessarily or wisdom or experience. But if they have an opinion, still you should listen to them. Maybe something good comes out of their mouth. Maybe some good idea comes to their mind. Even not if you are not learning anything from them, at least if you consult, this gives them courage. This is a kind of respect that you show to your people when you consult them, when you do ask for their opinion. So although you are a messenger, you receive a direct communication from Allah, but still you should consult people. This is very beautiful. In Islam, how much we respect people that even someone like Rasulullah is asked to consult then all mu'minin for sure must follow the example of Rasulullah this is why the Quran says وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ no one can say I don't need consultation everyone is in need of consultation and this consultation also has its own requirements unfortunately sometimes people take it very easy so for example today they consult this person tomorrow they consult another person everyone is passing by you know they may ask his opinion this is not enough consultation must be systematic the people that you consult must know the history behind this and also they must see the result so that in future when they give you an idea, they know what has happened when they gave you idea before. It's not that, for example, I am in charge of something and if by chance I see you, I say, what is your opinion about this? And then I say to myself, oh, Alhamdulillah, I am a good person. I you know, take advice from people. No. This is a very systematic approach that Islam asks us to observe. Anyway, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْعَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَهِ But when you consult people, at the end you have to be able to make up your mind and make a decision. You cannot remain, you know, in confusion. You have to make up your mind, but only after listening to people. It's very important. Listen to people, take their opinion, then you make your decision and trust God as we had in Surah Ahzab Allah loves the people who trust him for sure when Allah loves them it means that he supports them he helps them it's not just a duty for which you will get reward it's also something by which you can get 
help and support. Another verse, inshallah, we will discuss about it in next session. I just mentioned the verse so that you think about it. Verses 138 and 139 of Surah Tawbah. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ عَلَيْهِ تَبَكَّلْتْ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ The same idea of love for people, the same idea of concern, mercy, the idea of being annoyed, being troubled, but still you have to remain persistent and you should trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah we will talk about it in the next session. May Allah help us to follow the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah enable us to be in dunya and akhirah with Muhammad and Allah Muhammad. May Allah keep us and our children always on the right path. May Allah give his healing and shifa to the brothers and sisters who are ill. May Allah send his unlimited mercy to all who have passed away, especially those who have rights upon us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor our generation to be the generation which would prepare for the coming of Imam Mahdi al-Jalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif And may our Imam would be happy and pleased with our performance and our deeds. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.